let's talk about it. Hello and welcome back to Thick Radio, the podcast where we talk about gaining, feedism, and everything in their orbit. I'm James. And I'm Tim, so let's get into it. Today we're welcoming to the show for the first time. Today we've got Theodore. Hello. Hello. Thanks for having me. Thank you for being here. How are you? I'm doing okay. It's very hot where I am, and I'm trying to stay cool. It's quite warm here in London as well. It's that lovely end of summer heat that just makes you want to die. (laughs) (laughs) We we call those the dog days of summer. Yes. Yes. Very hot, very hot. But, ladies and gentlemen, if anyone who's not familiar with Fionor, you're about to be, because, first of all, Fionor is the definition of hot. Fionor is a very gorgeous, gorgeous gentleman. And uh, when we get the socials at the end, you'll have the chance to see for yourself. But today, uh, Fionor's joining us to talk on something a little bit different, but quite exciting. Uh, We're talking about dysphoria today. Is that right, Fionor? Yes. Fantastic. So... Before we really get into the meat of the subject, I kind of want to circle back to you yourself to get a, get a bit of a context for where this conversation is coming from. So for the listeners, can you just give us a bit of a rundown about your gaining journey so far? I can never recall a time when I did not want to be fatter. I have always wanted to do this, and I have felt this way, uh, you know, forever. So... um I can remember distinctly being five years old and looking in the mirror and wishing that I had, uh, that I was fatter, I had a bigger belly. And I would look at, uh, you know, like many people my age, the Guinness Book of World Records was really the only place where you could find pictures of very fat people. And the, the McGuire or McCrary tw- twins were uh, an early inspiration. I, in fact, it was so pervasive that I had this thought that I actually was fat, but there was this giant world's conspiracy to hypnotize me into thinking I wasn't. And I was a very thin child, and I was a very thin um, in my teen years and into early adulthood. And it was uh, extremely hard for me to gain weight, and I could only do it very, very slowly, if at all. It took me months and months and months to gain a single pound, and then I could lose it three pounds in a weekend. And then it would take me months and months and months to get those three pounds back. And I am older than the internet, so uh, it was very difficult for me to find. I mean, I was 25 until I met the only other person I ever heard about who wanted to do this. I mean, I heard one person talking about it in high school, but I did not feel it was safe to pursue uh, that topic with him. And... But when I finally met uh, Gainers, uh, it was wonderful. It was a revelation, and it actually led me to figuring out that I was gay, too. I love that. You know, and it, I, I appreciate that you reference your age, in a sense, saying that you are older than the internet, because something that Tim and I do constantly discuss, as much as we, of course, love our guests of all ages that we're able to have on, it always feels like there's never enough people from a specific generation or a specific age bracket willing to share those experiences. So it's wonderful to have someone like yourself here to really it's, share that. It's nice to have another old person on the show. <laughs> Thanks, I think. But, you know, I always end up feeling like, you know, because the majority of our guests are somewhere like in the range between maybe 21 and 32, you know, and so it's like, as the 40 year old i'm like well y'all don't remember the days before answering machines and (laughs) cell phones and the internet right but it is wonderful as i say to hear these experiences and you know this is of course a shout out to anyone listening who maybe isn't under 40 let's say uh open call please come on and share your experiences we'd love to hear more of it you know and Obviously, this is part of the conversations we've always had on the pod. It's interesting to reflect on the past of the community, where we've come from, how it diverged from the fetist community back in the 80s, and, you know, just all the things that have come along since then. We were talking about this briefly 
prior to the call the i think do they call it the Gromer history project yes it's really interesting to look through and again i'd encourage people to go check it out but you know it, it, it's it's great to hear and i i want to i want to circle in on something you said like when you were younger you felt like there was this hypnosis thing happening where people were trying to convince you that you actually weren't fat even though you believed yourself to be which as you acknowledge you weren't and that's fine but that's really interesting comparing that to what this episode is going to be focusing on which is dysphoria um and before we really get into the more specifics of that do you feel that your that kind of childhood lens is maybe an aspect of that dysphoria for yourself i i believe it was uh i believe it's good evidence that my ideas are correct so i mean on, on that point how long have you been considering these ideas around dysphoria it's been about three or four years i was um uh, you know transgendered people are in the news a lot these days because they're being used as a whipping boy by conservatives to get elected. So I started wondering why they use, and, and transgender dysphoria is the term that they use today, uh, where it had been uh, transgender identity disorder in the past. Uh, I think dysphoria is better. Uh, I think it's more accurate. And I like the way uh, terms and words can evolve to accommodate uh, new information. And I started wondering why they call it gender dysphoria or body dysmorphia. Like what's the difference between dysphoria and dysmorphia? And I looked it up and uh, I found that uh, I think a lot of gainers are dysphoric. I think a lot of gainers are dysmorphic too. I think that's been explored rather well, but I don't think dysphoria has been considered and I think it needs to be. I agree. Because, of course, we connected on this point, and I did some independent research just to kind of get myself a little bit more aware of it as we discuss. And the kind of comparison that I understand it as is that dysphoria is like a dissatisfaction with what you can accurately observe, whereas dysmorphia is the inability to perceive accurately what you're observing. So I think this is kind of the breakdown, you know, a dysmorphia is more in relation to where we look at a traditional eating disorder because you perceive yourself in a skewed light versus a dysphoria where you can accurately perceive your shape, your weight, your size and your frame and feel a dissatisfaction with it and a desire to transform it. Uh, do you feel like that aligns with uh, your understanding as well? Yes, I think that is an extremely good way to compare the two. I have been c comparing them by example in the past, uh, but I think your, your description is, is very concise and very accurate. So you could uh, use the example of two people who uh, want to alter their nose, get a nose job, basically. Uh, the person with dysphoria feels their nose is too big and uh, goes to get uh, their nose reduced and they see exactly what they felt like they needed and they are very happy and they're, they need it no more. But the person with dysmorphia still sees the big nose after the surgery and then gets another surgery and then still sees the big nose even though their nose is hardly there and gets another surgery, et cetera, et cetera. That would be dysmorphia. I think it's really interesting to contrast the two because I think you're right. I think it's not that, oh, people mislabel certain gainers as dysmorphic when really they're dysphoric. I think actually you're right in that both happen and that both need to be addressed as their own thing. Uh, I mean, Tim, as a yes. person who works in the medical field, I mean, do you have much experience working with patients who've experienced either? Not as a diagnosis anyway, no. Um, I don't, you know, my, the patient population that I mostly work with has been elderly or um, spinal injury. And <clears throat> most of the spinal injury patients I've had have also been senior citizens. So I haven't had a ton of experience with anyone younger. And uh, I don't know if these diagnoses don't end up on uh, older generations lists because they don't ever talk about it or 
maybe those, you know, they were diagnosed with things 20 or 30 years ago and the conversation just hasn't come up again. I, I, I feel like I know people in my personal life who suffer from, from these kinds of, of things rather than in my professional. I'd be curious to ask Fianor, how has your gaining journey shifted since developing this understanding of dysphoria and its place in your life? Well, uh, the journey with relating to gaining hasn't altered much, but I have, I feel, a new tool in which to successfully engage with healthcare professionals. I talked to a counselor and my general practitioner about it, and they both seem to think it's accurate. And when I described my journey and the journey of others, they seem to think that this was a valid thing. Um, but of course, probably somebody needs to do some research. I personally would like to collect stories from people and plant this bug in people's ears to make them think about uh, what is their reason for gaining, how much is dysmorphia and how much is dysphoria. It's important, I think, because the difference has a, a, a different approach from healthcare. Whereas if you are dysmorphic, it's your mind and your brain that needs to be changed in order to bring you happiness. But if you are dysphoric, it's your body that needs to be changed to bring you into happiness. And mm -hmm. so you then have a different kind of diagnosis. And uh, our culture worldwide and also in the United States is uh, does not consider mental health on par with physical health. And so that creates a lot of problems. Uh, and so with dysmorphia, people are often uh, approached in a sort of idea as, well, it's your fault and you need to fix it and grow up. And uh, that's very damaging, but nonetheless, it still happens. And dysphoria, especially thanks to all of our wonderful transgender brothers and sisters, and siblings, uh, there's a lot more knowledge about just the term dysphoria in general. And when that's applied to us accurately, I think it can lead to better outcomes. Uh, I have a doctor who is not telling me to lose weight now. I have a doctor who says, I will help you. And I think that that's valuable. I'm not sure every doctor is gonna do that. He sent me to a nutritionist to evaluate my caloric intake because he didn't believe how much I was eating and still not gaining weight. Uh, and she was quite against this <laughs> and uh, really wasn't listening to what I had to say. And um, so big surprise. It's like, yeah, it's not like it's going to be, you know, sunshine and roses for everybody. Uh, but I think this is a better way that we can do it. And the counselor who was intrigued uh just said you know i'd love to research this with uh you but i don't have the time he said however a place it's important for these psychological disorders which are currently undiagnosed and uncategorized and people don't think exist it's important for the people who are experiencing these things to tell their own stories to begin with he said that's how transgender people got their um stories out into the mainstream and got research generated so i would like to collect people's stories which i will tell anonymously in hopefully a big paper that can then get some publication and we can start working towards clinical acceptance of this term and uh it can help gainers everywhere um deal with the healthcare professionals in a more positive light because I am, I mean, based on the decades long, you know, community involvement of myself, most people do not talk about this with their doctor um, for obvious reasons, the hostility. Uh, and I think if they could, it would be better all around. Even physical health would be better. And just being able to unburden this, we all know that the closet is a place of death. And so if we can be open about this with people we need to be open with, like our healthcare professionals, then I think it'll be a, just healthier for everybody. I agree. You know, and I've got to say, this is really 
it's triggered this thought in my mind that I don't think I'd really considered previously, but something that's really worth acknowledging, you know, even if you look at homosexuality itself, right? I talk about how homosexuality wasn't decriminalized in parts of Australia until 1997. And part of that process of decriminalization was not just sodomy laws, but it was also laws about mental psychosis. The idea that in order to be a sodomite, as it was understood in terminology, in psychology, you were fucked in the head. And therefore, uh, if you could be uh, sentenced as such, be given injections, be subjected to treatments to try to cure you, which is terrifying, right? And this yes. was not that fucking long ago. I was alive. I'm a 30 year old man. I was alive on this planet when this shit was still happening. And to this day, we are aware there are places in the world that do not accept you for being homosexual. They will still, put you in. and that's not great, right? But when we're looking at the history of what's happened for us just in homosexuality alone, we have had to go through that journey, not because we should, but because this is simply the way society understood it. And so we've had to do our part through politics, through Stonewall, through marching, through pride, through open and honest conversation to help shift the world perception of us from one of a predatory and deviant nature to one of understanding and acceptance. And don't get me wrong, there are still intolerable people. Unfortunately, I think that's always going to be the case. But this clinical aspect, I think, is something that we don't really talk about and don't appreciate that that happened parallel to just the pure visual social side of it. So there's got to be an element of that for gaining in fetism as well. I mean, for example, we are referred to on the sexual spectrum as either adipophilia or lipophilia, both of which meaning an obsession with fat. But the suffix of philia is because we are classified as a paraphilia. And what is classified as a paraphilia are things that are seen as dangerous and deviant when taken to the extreme, which is why you also get terms like pedophilia, because that's where it comes under. And that makes me immediately uncomfortable as an objectively neighboring construct. Like, no, 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 sweetie. We are nowhere near that. We are doing right. something very, very different, purely in the realm of consent regardless of what certain documentaries want to try and paint us as, uh, we operate in the realm of consent. So, you know, there is a huge conversation that needs to happen about genuinely reshifting our position from where we are listed as and helping us migrate to somewhere better. And as you say, it can be anonymous, but it still takes people sharing their stories and submitting their data to people on our side of the fence who can be trusted with that and represented appropriately to help the world understand who we are because unfortunately for our community when we shut our doors when a new article comes out or a new documentary comes out and certain websites close up shop and <laughs> don't want any new people coming in that prevents us from taking the opportunity to step forward, you know? And we've always said this, totally understandable why certain people don't come forward, aren't open about their things with friends, family, colleagues, makes perfect sense. But in terms of owning who we are and what we do, there certainly needs to be more of that, I think, to start to make that change happen. Yes, I agree. And the first step is to realize that you are not broken you are not sick and you don't need fixing. And I think body dysphoria will give you that. Now, I'm not saying there's no body dysmorphia in the gaining community. I'm not saying that at all. It definitely is. I've talked to more than one gainer who says it's never enough. And I can see that. Um, but I think a lot of us, maybe most of us have some degree, maybe all, body dysphoria. We all know the gainer who gained 30 pounds and was like, yeah, I feel great. This is it for me. So we got to understand to ourselves, much like when we come to terms with homosexuality, homosexuality isn't a part of us that's broken and needs being fixed. If you have gender dysphoria, you are transgender, you are not broken and you do not need to be fixed. So if you are a gainer, you are not broken and you do not need to be fixed. 
as mm -hmm. far as categorizing us with uh, sexual deviancy, there is research into gaining and encouraging, but almost entirely that has been done in terms of the sexual side of it. And I think it's interesting also that no encourager can be body dysphoric, right? It's about the gainer. So the encourager is often where the sexuality aspects of this will come into play. I'm not saying the gainers don't feel sexually aroused by getting fatter, they do. And many gainers are also encouragers. But for many of us, it goes beyond that into encompassing the whole of our being, which includes our sexuality, but other aspects as well. I completely agree. And honestly, that, that thing you said before about some gainers gain 30 pounds and they go, yeah, that's it. Say it again, baby, say it again. Because, you know, I, I think we've always kind of come back to this point, right? Like, yes, from a sex perspective, yes, from an encouragement perspective, it's wonderful to see people who want to go from 150 to 250, 350, 450, 550 and beyond. That's wonderful to see, but that's clearly not everyone. And I think when we shut down that conversation, when we say, you know, unless you're gaining, you don't matter. Like what, what was it that Pearl said? Nothing you say matters unless that camera's are rolling. Your presence in this community does not matter unless the scales are rolling upwards. You know what I mean? Like, and God forbid you should lose weight willingly or not. People will, pff, people can turn on you in an instant. And that's not good, right? To me, that says a lot about the over-focus of sex in our community and not a lot of the focus on humanity, which, you know, I think a lot of the time people will also argue, oh, well, it's a sex fetish. You shouldn't be surprised that people are so horny. And yet I've never felt like physically unsafe around BDSM practitioners. I've never felt like I was in the proximity of getting whipped without my consent in a leather bar. I think actually when we say to humans, you can act like a human and we will hold you accountable as such people will rise to the occasion and learn to adhere to that culture when we kind of intentionally don't and just leave it all up to the rampant fapping that goes on i think that's where you kind of get that and i feel like that's also part of what leads to the dysmorphia we're seeing right um it can and i want to uh, challenge our listeners to say rampant fapping four times fast <laughs> <laughs> rampant fapping, rampant fap, rap, shit. <laughs> is, it, is this is this like Beetlejuice? Like if you say it three times, like uh, oh, oh, oh. in your room, you, and, you, uh, you call up, up you call up a gray headed uh, encourager who's going to ghost you in a day. <laughs> <laughs> that is not to besmirch the encouragers who show up and do the correct thing. We love you and we edify you. If you out there and you do the wrong thing, you know who you are, and we know who. <laughs> <laughs> because we all talk but people do need to know that like just because you read it in a warren davis uh story does not mean mm. that it translates to real life oh my god can we have that conversation real quick like i will for the, i will be 90 years old and still diddly my skittle to the fucking images from doughboys but the shape dimensions of these men it is just not possible. Yeah, no, nobody looks like that. No, like, again, it's that tinge of reality. And we talked about this, what was it, episode two or three of the entire podcast? Fantasy versus reality. We're talking about this constantly coming back to it, this point of the people just need to understand a bit better, right? Like that there is this, this is hot, this is great, but also once we come out of that, and before we go into it, there is a whole human with a whole life and a whole series of everything like on the other side of it. And I do feel like talking more about this dysphoria versus dysmorphia, you know, this is where we can probably see that this happens, right? Because like, maybe you are satisfied with your weight. Maybe you're satisfied with the, the, the rate that you're gaining, with the food that you're eating to gain. And people just innocuously are like, oh, you could be bigger. You could probably eat more. You could probably push it, you know? And I think if you grew a little bit more, you'd probably have more people wanting to follow you, more people wanting to meet up with you. That's an enticement. And then you push yourself. And maybe because we see people in the community 
theoretically succeeding when we're not, that can add to that dysmorphia where it's like, gosh, everyone else is growing and I'm, I'm not. In fact, it feels like I'm losing weight. It feels like I'm small, so small, so scrawny. I'll never be good enough. I'll never be big enough. Like you can see how that line of thinking very quickly becomes that, you know what I mean? Yeah, I think it depends on the person. I think some people look for their value and how they're perceived by others. Mm. I do want to open something up here, right? Because this is something that I want to write about. I feel that the true power in gaining is not actually about gaining weight itself, but it is about liberation from diet culture, which is very much in line with what fat liberation aims to do, right? Because I think it's easy to describe if people ask about gaining and you say, oh, well, it's like weight loss, but in reverse, I gain weight, I feel good, I'm happy, blah, blah, blah. Like, very good shorthand, you know? But in reality, the reason why diet culture is so insepid is not because the idea of being thin is wrong, but because there are industries dedicated to this and because those industries make so much money off of constantly and consistently belittling you and billions, billions of dollars per year. Billions. Hundreds, of, hundreds of billions. I think it's around the 270 billion mark at this point, the combined industries. So you look at that and that's what people are making by creating a dysmorphia that makes you feel like you'll never be skinny enough. Like we all think, oh, the person who's skinny, they get it all. Sure, they have that privilege and access, but it's also the thing of like, you're on top of the mountain now. If you fuck up, you have the farthest to fall. Like that shit. Do you know how many waif thin girls I've known over the years, waifish thin thin girls that would be uh, completely accepted by any facet of society. And all, one of the biggest gripes I heard from them was I'm still too fat. I, and I wanted to be like, you weigh 110 pounds for Christ's sake. Like how much smaller do you think you can get? But that's, huh? that's the insidious nature of these industries. They crawl into your head and they make you feel like nothing you do is ever going to be good enough. Uh, I'd like to interject here. It's all capitalism. Just yeah. follow the money. The only reason people ever buy anything is because they need to, they feel the need to improve or change or get better. And so when they want you to buy something, the easiest route for them to succeed is to get you to hate yourself. That's capitalism. That's how it works. 100%. And I just want to put it out here, you know, when I say that there's a concern about that reversal happening in the gainer community, it's the same sort of thing where as queer people, we don't drop our racism or our misogyny at the door when we become out as queer right like let's even simplify it further as gay men you don't drop your misogyny because you're now interested in men right you're just channeling that to a different person and if you listen to a lot of the verbal rhetoric amongst men this vaginal hate this idea of like mm, women uh, periods uh, all the, you know it's the same misogyny that never gets resolved because people think oh well i'm a part of this and so now this thing doesn't matter but actually it's still within you and it still needs to be resolved similarly with the fat phobia and i think with the construct of dysmorphia because our society primes us for it i think it's very easy to slip in the gainer community where because you see everyone growing so much we've been reared in this way to want to lose weight to think to lose weight we come into this society now we have to do the same thing but in reverse and this is where I think, as you were saying, this understanding of dysphoria is so important because if we can understand the distinction between the two, we can probably hold ourselves more accountable when dysphoria starts to morph into dysmorphia. We can probably build language around it. We can probably build a support network around it and really help people to feel more in control of their gains. Yeah, I, I agree with that. Also, I think... Uh... Dis, the idea of dysphoria helps it center the conversation and the thoughts on the human being, whereas dysmorphia might center the thoughts on parts of a human being and more objectifying. And, um, you know, there can be something powerful of that. You know, being seen as a sex object can be powerful things like that. But it's all complicated and there's a lot of intersectionality here. And I think we just need to be careful. And as you mentioned a while ago, consent, you know, consent centering. And people maybe don't think of that as broadly as they could sometimes. And they could think, well, does this person want me to say, you could eat more, you should eat more? 
or do they not want me to say that? Because sometimes people really want that or some people do want that. And it's important to communicate and find out what this person you're talking to, what this person you're helping, what this person you're attracted to needs in order to, you know, A, want to keep coming back to you <laughs> and B, have a healthy, fun time. I've said before, like, um, if it is for some people negging does work like it's, it's sort of that um like a drill sergeant or a, or a way like a, a personal trainer or someone or that's just like yelling in your ear like do more you're not doing enough and some people thrive on that i personally do not i have always hated nagging um and it has literally never worked on me once so i mean like, like you said everybody's different look i've said this before I don't think negging ever works because I think there is a big difference between negging and a humiliation kink. There is a huge difference between feeling aroused by the commentary, right? Negging is an intent to tear someone down based on a power construct. Negging is built in such a way as it is designed to cause harm. It is never designed to make someone feel good about themselves. So. But, but again, that's kind of the whole point of this conversation, dysmorphia versus dysphoria. There is a distinction between the two and it's understanding where you fit in that. You know, I think there's a great resource that I would recommend. It's a book just titled Feederism. Um, I think, uh, sexual pleasure, weight gain and eating by, uh, Kathy Charles and Michael Bukowski. I just finished reading it not too long ago. It's probably one of the most in-depth pieces of research on our communities that I've ever come across. And it's a really interesting read because I think a lot of the points that you mentioned, Fionor, about how there's this idea of clinicalizing certain things. And it even references how, you know, the reason why uh, we are classified under paraphilia comes within the way a certain piece of document is written. But the person who originally invented that charter was someone who viewed sexuality through a lens of perversion. Their original definition of fetish which was the only distinction to sexuality was, oh, everyone can experience perversion, but only the perverted ever give in to their perversions. Otherwise you're a good person. So even the measuring stick by which sexuality is kept distinct to kink, fetish and paraphilia is rooted in like this kind of- They always have to bring morality into it, don't they? There's always some moral thing that they try to throw in there. Christianic moralistic bullshit. Which, again, no wonder people feel such an innate sense of shame because it's built into the system, right? Um, but again, I, I just think that's such an important conversation. And I think the ultimate takeaway from today is not going to be, oh, we talked about this. Here is the decision. Like, no, every single one of us needs to have this conversation with every single member of the community that we are friends with to build that framework, right? Um I do want to bring in something though that I've always found really fascinating and I think people may not have heard of this term body integrity identity disorder or bid um yes it is for the people listening you probably know this as the scenario where someone wants to amputate a limb because they psychologically feel like they shouldn't have it and then they go and get that done Fionor as you say you've done some research in and around all of this have you come across this before what are your thoughts on this Yes. Uh, when I was talking to the counselor, he told me about this, which I had only vaguely heard of before. And I think it's it's uh, sort of uh, psychologically adjacent to dysphoria. And the interesting thing that I heard was that when they do brain scans of people and they look at the area in the brain where the perceived alien limb is, it's different. It's It's darker or it doesn't light up the same way. And, um, and so they can see that the brain has an image of the body that is different from the body and that once those are brought into alignment, happiness occurs. But it's really, it's the brain that trumps everything just in the way that you are gay, whether you're having sex or not, right? It's attraction that dictates your identity. It is not your behavior. There are plenty of heterosexual people in certain situations that will have sex with someone of the same gender. And there are plenty of celibate people that are heterosexual or homosexual or whatever. It's about the desire, not about the behavior. And that's true in body integrity disorder. And it's true in body dysphoria. 
And it can also be true in body dysmorphia, right? Because whether you're actively gaining, you are still a gainer if you have those feelings. Yes, say that again, please, because I, again, I, I, I want us, all these conversations around gatekeeping, we call it gain shaming. You're not big enough to be considered a gainer. You haven't put in enough hours. You're not eating enough. You're not doing it fast enough. Kill every single one of these conversations, please. Like it's just <laughs> you're not doing it fast enough. You're not gaining enough for what? But for, for me to turn off to your picture? Who cares? Right? Oh my gosh! And like, it just if I get one more person, one more person, because like I I know people will put up like sometimes when they eat junk food. I am one of the few people I see putting up like cooking a meal. Like I did four lamb chops the other night, right? With chips and with veg. And do you want to know the amount of people who are like, that's not enough? Bitch, shut the fuck up. Like you are not here cooking this food for me, buying this food for me. This is me doing my best. Good point. You know, the people who have pointed out that I should be eating at some point, like if I'm trying, like if they're messaging me on one of the social apps and like, I'm telling them what I'm doing and everything. And they tell me, I, I want to be like, well, you're not paying for my food. So like... <laughs> If you're not gonna toss me a twenty in in my mm. PayPal account, like why am I even bothering with this? I mean, you could just use the phrase "I accept donations." <laughs> yeah, there was a person once who would not stop harassing me for pics, and I tell you right now, when I dropped that PayPal link, oh, I have never seen that fucking availability light flick off to offline so fast. I have never practically whiplash, you know. So I want to ask here, right? Because obviously we're talking around a couple of different concepts here. Dysphoria, dysmorphia, body integrity disorder as well, bid for short, like kind of same universe, right? Operating in. And there's a lot of things to talk around. Do you feel there are any talking points that we haven't touched on yet that we should do? Um, I don't think so, except I would like to mention that I, I encourage, haha, people to contact me through Grammar. And if they are interested in sharing their stories for a paper, or if they want to discuss this, or if they have ideas or any thoughts to share on this matter. There was something I was curious about. And uh, to, you know, admittedly, I, I'm not sure that I have this as a fully complete thought yet, but um, I've noticed that over the last 20 years, there's been kind of a pushback against um, certain labels that get, at, that get placed on um, mental issues that come up physical issues it's like people push back against whenever something is labeled as a disorder because of the negativity uh, the pejorative connotation to it so like because I, I believe that now we don't even say developmentally disabled anymore we say developmentally different you know like when we started when we changed from saying um because I, I, we're not really saying autism spectrum anymore are we we're saying uh, uh oh crap i'm losing it now what it what is it called? Um, neurodivergent, neuro neurodivergent, right? Neurodivergent. Yes. So I guess I'm asking, like, do you think that there will be any kind of pushback from younger generations against labeling something as, you know, you, like using the negative of it? Like, so like when we say dis, we still mean negative, right? It's dysphoria, dysmorphia, disorder. Right um do you think that we'll see people saying like can we stop using pejoratives to describe it should we not come up right. with yet another term to just say that it's different rather than it's because whenever we say disorder we're it's like saying something's wrong well so i i'm a, I'm a bit of a language nerd and uh as i mentioned earlier i love it when there are new terms that are coined that can give us more accuracy I, I also do not like new terms that are coined to give us less accuracy. Mm -hmm. uh, and so uh, I just want to address many of the things that you brought up, which I think are very important things. The first thing I want to say is that the prefix for dysmorphia and dysphoria is D-Y-S, which means um, it's the opposite of you. Like euphoria, you have a feeling of wonderfulness and uh, ecstasy whereas dysphoria you have feelings that are unpleasant and depressive and that is different from the dis disorder and so disorder is something that is is out or against 
order. So they're, they're subtly different, but I think they are different and it's important, I think, to make that distinction. And then we can address, I asked this very question. I was uncomfortable with the term disorder when I referred to say body dysmorphic disorder or body dysphoric disorder, things like that. And I talked to this counselor and, and, and he gave me some information which I thought was pertinent and um, maybe not everybody's willing to hear this or, or agrees with it and that's all fine. But I, I think that um, we all need to understand that maybe there are some different perspectives of this and we need to use language accurately and we used to need to use ang language that doesn't hurt people. But the idea of calling something a disorder or not calling it a disorder because, and, and that's different from disabled. Disabled and disorder are different things. So a disorder is when it's causing stress in the individual. Okay. So that's why uh, I once heard somebody say, you shouldn't call it PTSD because uh, post-traumatic stress is a natural reaction to some stress, right? It's not a disorder, it's a natural reaction. But this counselor was telling me that it's a disorder because it's causing stress. It doesn't mean it's unnatural. It doesn't mean it's inherently, inherently negative, and it doesn't mean it's that person's fault. Absolutely not. So in a clinical sense, the clinical definition of disorder is perhaps something we should all be more aware of if we're going to have these conversations. Um, and I think if people are aware of the actual clinical definition of it and they still would prefer to have it changed, then that's a great conversation to have. Mm. Um, but I think if, if we're not going to understand the word as it is, then we can't even have that conversation. Right. Very true. Right. It's probably an element to which it's like, a, I mean, I'll say it because I can faggot, right? Like that is a word that was a slur towards queer men and women. Uh, but it's one we can reclaim as queer men. Well, and we even reclaimed the word queer because when I was growing up, queer was a slur. You know, so sometimes words can even have their root in something that is negative, but be reclaimed culturally back for something, you know, and there's also a point there's um, a movement at the moment called the Missia Pledge, which is essentially trying to replace the suffix of phobia in certain political terms like homophobia, queerphobia, Islamophobia, because it relates to the construct of fear and replace it with misia, which in the Latin is more in relation to a hate. So it's a movement that looks to kind of do away with homophobia and replace it with homomisia. And mind you, I think that there's a place for that. Maybe it'll happen, who knows? But, you know, it's, it's wonderful that the conversation happens at all. And it's interesting when people get so caught up in it being like, oh, there are too many terms, I don't like all these changes, where it's like, why not? Like, we're all just trying to communicate and, you know, get to the, get to the end point where we understand what we're on about, you know? And I can, I can sort of understand the whole, like, oh, there's too many, because Fianor, maybe, you know, you agree with me on this. Like, I feel like when we were growing up uh, or, or when we came into the gay world, right. You know, um, you heard, you heard this a lot from gay men. I don't like labels. I don't like labels. Don't label me. I don't like labels. And I remember everybody always saying that. And then all of a sudden it was like, no, now there were thousands of labels and everybody was much more comfortable with them. And I'm like, what exactly caused that shift? You know? Yeah, that's an interesting question. I, I'm not entirely certain, but I do remember, you know, the slogan, labels belong on beer. Yeah. Like I remember, it was just, everyone was like, I don't want to be boxed in. So you know, maybe, maybe it was because at that time, labels were used to marginalize people and now labels are used to empower people i never thought of it that way i think much like all things it comes back to that point of it's all swings and roundabouts you know it depends on the context it depends on who says it and who does what like i use the example all the time in the australian vernacular cunt is a wildly <laughs> diverse word I, I, I have I'd love that word yeah. I really wish that Americans didn't get so uptight about that particular because I think it's a fun word but like you say it over here and it's like the worst thing that you can say to a woman and I'm just like well it has a different meaning here yeah <laughs> but it's interesting like how it all differs and again it's context it's regional it's all of those things right exactly exactly and re with regards to homophobia I mean that's an interesting thing that they're doing but I have always really liked 
the phobia aspect of this because all hatred is rooted in fear. You can't have one without the other. And the fear is ultimately the motivator. It's fear first, then hatred, not the other way around. And so I believe it's actually more accurate to say homophobia or Islamophobia than it is. Really, that's the whole original definition for xenophobia, isn't it? It's yeah. the idea mm -hmm. of, like, I am fearful of that. Foreign which, things. Is there anything in particular that um, you want listeners to take away from today's conversation? Um, I want them to consider what the difference between dysphoria and dysmorphia means, how that affects your particular gaining perspective, and uh, if you have a story to share or opinions to offer, I would love to hear them. Wonderful. That's fantastic. So look, thank you again for joining us today. Where can the listeners find you online? Uh, they can find me on Grammar as Fionor which is a character from Tolkien, by the way. Oh, yeah, from the um, from the Silmarillion? The Silmarillion, yes. Yeah. Fionor made the Silmarils. Fantastic. Fionor made the Silmarils, and this Fionor is going to make for us a fantastic project piece to help us better understand our bodies. So, you know, it's all, it's all swings and roundabouts, and we love to hear it. But that is it for another week here on Thick Radio. Please remember to like and subscribe, rate us five stars, and leave us a good review. Now, if you liked this episode, the podcast, or just us in general, share it with your friends and encourage them to tune in. You can find me on Instagram, Beefy Frat, and Stuff and Show at Stanham. And you can find me on Instagram, Twitter, YouTube, TikTok, and Beefy Frat at Thicky Mouse. You can also look us up on Instagram and TikTok at Thick Radio or at our website at www.podpage.com forward slash thick radio. If you want to submit a voice note, you can find the link in the show notes. And if you have any questions or ideas for episodes, you can reach us at thethickradio at gmail.com. So until next time, bye fats. Bye fats. Bye fats. Let's talk about it. Thick Radio is a Patreon and Anchor app podcast produced by Stan and Thicky Mouse. Next and mastered by Stan. Our artwork is provided by Lokitu. Our theme song is provided by Body by Training.